I met Andre in, in Moscow in 2007, I think, uh, for the first time. He was talking about front-end architecture. I mean, front-end architecture in 2007, like 10 years ago. Like, he, he, I think he, po po he pi pioneered this term or something like this. And, and also brand new library called jQuery. That was, that was something, like you, you had two talks. We on had point. a talk about prototype.js. Oh. jQuery didn't exist yet. Oh, really? Nope. Okay, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm just getting, getting old. And uh, he is the third speaker from Vienna on our conference. We have just eight speakers and he's third. We have Austrian Mafia here. And I'm not sure what, how this happens, but why not? Vienna is a, is a, is a, is a really lovely, lovely city. So uh, you, you'll, you'll have a chance to see nice people from Vienna and visit it some, someday. But now, CSS and GS, and this is something that we really wanted to have on this conference because to add some uh, bit of a spice, uh, JavaScript spice and um, maybe maybe to add something something interesting something new s to talk about future how, how it might look like so just go thanks for being for a really nice introduction <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here um, I'm originally from Russia but I yeah as I as he said I live in Vienna for almost 10 years now <laughs> so um, yeah thanks for welcoming me and uh, for having me. And my name is Andre, uh, and I work with web technology since 1999, I guess. Uh, and in Vienna, I also a co-organizer of React Vienna community. We have tons of communities, not just CSS community in Vienna. We have a React community, we have a JavaScript community. Uh, and I'm designer of uh, Color Snapper. It's a, a developer's tool uh, I made with my friend, also from Vienna, uh, so yeah. <laughs> Uh, but today I'm here to talk about uh, CSS in GS. Uh, and before I even start talking about CSS or JavaScript, I would really like us to take a short, a really brief look at the history of CSS and how we get here. And then we will uh, take a look at how it looks right now and how I think it might look in the future and why uh, you have to start paying attention to this approaches, I guess. Time, sh time will show us, but uh, nobody knows now. So um, the first thing I want to say is that CSS was designed to style HTML documents. And in previous talk, uh, we uh, saw this evolution, how we get from non-styled HTML documents to styled HTML documents. And CSS serves the purpose really, really, really well. I really like this uh, declarative approach. Um, how many of you? Remember this project called CSN Scene Garden? Yeah, we all old here. <laughs> um, but this project was so cool. It, it blew my mind when I firstly uh, saw it because like, it, it showed us developers that separation of markup and presentation is really a good thing because now we can like we are like gods. We can just change CSS file and you know like you get the completely different design. And it, but like it, it all worked thanks for Cascade, right? By the way, how many of you, I'm not raising my hand, but raise your hand if you ever redesigned a website entirely in CSS. Okay, yeah, just like 10% or even less. That's what I thought. And here's the thing. So CSS was designed for documents, but not for web applications. And today we're building really, really, really complex web applications, or like most of us, I hope so, uh, because this is how the web looks right now. And it doesn't look like a website to me, because if you look at this, it's, it's not actually a website. This is an application built completely on web technologies for creating websites in web browser. And the thing is, <clears throat> the problem we have is that we still try to apply the same principles we use, we used to build websites to building web applications. And one of these principles, for example, is separation of concerns. So we have this JavaScript, CSS, and HTML, and someone told us, this is our concerns. We have to separate them. But the thing is, as humans, uh, I don't know what's happening now. Um, as humans, we actually would like to separate concerns a little bit differently because this is how we think about our user interface, right? We think about this 
modules we see on screen, not about technologies we use to program these modules. And these modules, I call them UI components. Um, and this is a kind of, kind of a little bit different abstraction as browser use to describe the uh, user interface we're building. Uh, and these UI components, um, they can be, as, as in the first talk, first talk was amazing, it was exactly the same topic I'm talking right now. It showed us how from tiny, tiny, tiny components we can compose the whole system. It's called design system, it's not just, you know, code uh, uh, or this is some rules we can apply to these components to make the whole thing, thing work and look similarly. Yeah? So it's, kind of, it's, about, it's, it's not just about technology, it's about design. And UI components, they <coughs> Uh, the purpose of them is to encapsulate logic, markup, and presentation. Um, this is where you get to nowadays. And this is where I bring this in. Uh, this is HTML in JavaScript, right? Also known as J6. You might have heard of it, um, because a couple of years ago when React was presented to the world, um, it got some very mixed reactions. Yeah, it's, it's kind of, some people were like, and then some people were like, no, it's, it's, it's all shit. <laughs> I, if you search for like, React is terrible idea, you get like pages and pages of articles. People wrote articles why this is terrible idea. Uh, but you know what the thing is? Like, <laughs> shit tons of companies using this technology right now. And we are happy, really happy about it. So. I, like, I don't know who's right here, but I think if it works for you, this is good. And the thing is, React is getting more and more traction, and even like many, many frameworks um, uh, were introduced that basically shared the same ideas. So React is not just one thing, it's basically an idea. And this idea is really simple. It encapsulates markup and logic into one single JavaScript component. And the second principle of React is your user interface is pure function. So if you have your state, you can get user interface out of it. And if the state changes, you get another user interface. And this thing in between, it's declarative. And it's predictable. And these two, two principles are really important uh, for the whole ecosystem for like basically this change changes how we think of user interface, how we do our work, how, do our, uh, how we work at our jobs. Um, but what about styles? Because React didn't uh, give us any instruction on how to deal with CSS and styling. Um, so JSX logic, um, cover, uh, JSX covers logic and HTML markup. Um, and this is example like we want to color, like we want to change the color for a button to green. But because we still use CSS to style our components, we basically, we agree that we still use global styles, right? And some leaks might happen. Um, and this leads to unpredictable things. This is what I see, how I imagine unpredictability. So we expected something, but we get something that doesn't look quite what <laughs> is what we expected, but it's close, yeah, it's, it might work even. Uh, you get an idea. <laughs> And we have these name collisions, and we even depend on the order of how we load our style sheets. I mean, yeah, what can possibly go wrong here, right? <laughs> so who wins here? Like, what color will it be, blue or orange, right? It depends. I, can, I, I can't answer this question. So we've had to find some hacks to, you know, work around the issue. So we started to use, like, we could increase the specificity, um, but it led us to this problem. So we start increasing ink as the project grows, and at some time point we end up here, which is like a real mental overload. So even, like, if you wrote it and you, like, you're looking at it, uh, yeah. So this is where BAM comes in, right? Uh, there are uh, different methodologies, and today we we in Russia. <laughs> in this country of BAM, Every now, everyone knows what BAM is, right? Yeah, this is what I thought. I didn't even include uh, other, other guys, uh, but there are different methodologies. They are pretty, pretty much the same in, 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 in the idea. They try to uh, basically safeguard us from mistakes. 
And in a nutshell, BAM provides us with a set of rules and conventions that can significantly decrease the complexity of CSS on a bigger project. Um, so the idea is like we're having block, element, and modifier, and this special syntax, how we name. So basically, it's not even syntax, it's, it's just a convention how we, how we describe our class names. So without BAM, I, our block might look like this, and with BAM, yeah. We basically we prefix everything, and uh, we actually not just prefixing because we are basically giving up on some of the CSS features called Cascade. But this gives us encapsulation and prevents from unpredictability, right? So BAM helps us solve this, which is how debugging looks in CSS usually, right? Um, but the thing with um, BAM is it requires lots of manual work. It's kind of also a mental overlord. It's, it's hard to, you know, this is an example from the official website. So imagine how would you refactor this. So let's say I have this nav block. Now I want to call it navigation. Well, yeah. Um, you have to update like all instances of it. And, and, and it's just a string. So you, you might, you know, yeah, regex. Find and replace, don't do this, it's, it's bad. So yeah, it requires lots of work um, and lots of mistakes can slip in because of you, you don't have any safety when you're replacing some, some strings to another strings, you might replace something different. Um, so yeah, <clears throat> but as humans, um, we kind of learned how to automate boring work. So we have like, I don't know, hundreds of years of automating our jobs. And um, yeah, no secret, a couple of, let's say, years after or months after that thing became uh, popular, CSS modules uh, uh, um, became a thing, right? <clears throat> so a couple of smart guys sat together and um, told, okay, what if we, you know, what if we just generate class names uh, because we, like, what if all our style sheets would be local by default? Um, and this is an example. So this is before BAM. So we still use this as a React component, but it might be any, any templating language or just uh, plain HTML you're injecting into DOM. It doesn't matter. So you still use the strings here. And after you, the thing here is you have this explicit import of styles, which is an object. And now you operate on, not on strings, but on uh, some references to some thing that exists in some, you know, in runtime, and, or even static analyzer can say that it, what it is. And now you can do some nice things like refactorings. Or, uh, yeah, you can now say where it comes from and, um, like, <clears throat> do lots of stuff. But it's not standard, so this compose and value features in CSS modules aren't standard. So it, it requires some learning and requires some discussions, and it's still not uh, any, in any standard yet. And the build step is also required. No, there is no dead, dead code elimination. So we still kind of suck at what we want uh, to do. And <clears throat> here's a CSS in JavaScript library called JSS. I made a logo for it. I think it takes the, you know, <laughs> The spirit, um, yeah. Actually, yeah, it was kind of a fun joke for me, but yeah, uh, Alek uh, Slabotsky uh, or Slabotskoy, uh, who lives in Berlin, uh, he, he appreciated that logo, so now it's official one. Um, so what would be if we could just write styles in JavaScript? Would, it, would this be, I don't know, some advantage? Could this give us some advantages? Um, because we, we kind of we like the approach with CSS modules, but we want to solve a little bit more problems, right? So again, this is uh, before, this is a BAM style, and this is after. So we, again, we have these styles coming from some, some location which is defined, and we have these uh, references to our object, these styles. And it's, it looks pretty similar to me. Uh, but the interesting thing about this approach is now we have um, also, like all of the all, all of benefits of CSS modules, but now we have additional things. Uh, and first one is it uses 
W3C standards, uh, JavaScript, is standardized language. It's nothing they, you know, they made up. <coughs> There's no build step required. You might use one for performance reasons, in, but that's not the point right now. And there is like dead code elimination and automatic vendor prefixing, which is also quite good because you don't depend on, on all this tooling uh, from before. So it's kind of easier to do. Um, and if we can erase class names, why do we still use class attribute, right? And there is a really nice book. I'm, I'm also a designer, as I said before. And I, 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 a couple of years ago, I read this uh, classic work. Uh, it's called The Design of Everyday Things by Don Norman. Uh, and there is a concept of natural mapping in this book. Um, and it's basically, it says, for us, for humans, some things feel natural and some doesn't. And, um, what do you say? Which one is like is better in this case? The right one, exactly, because it like it it kind of maps to what you see, and to me this is a kind of an idea behind style components, because what style components by Max Steuber and Glenn Madern, the co-creator of CSS modules, makes it takes this approach of like CSS modules and JSS and all this like CSS and GS further and removes the link between like classes and DOM nodes. So when you write style component, you kind of, you attach your styles to, to the DOM node. And it looks nice because it's, it's just title now. And styles is implementation detail. But this, this approach um, can be uh, improved because now we can like we can take power of JavaScript. And by the way, this is also a standardized syntax. This is uh, the, like this is ECMAScript uh, standard, so it's not like something invented. It's not supported in all browsers, so it, it needs to be transpiled. But today we transpile everything, I guess. Nobody writes ECMAScript 5 anymore, um, or like I guess so. But I, like I also hope so. So Bubble is kind of a standard tool for us for JavaScript developers. Um, but here it's, it's an interesting thing because now we can take some props from our components, basically where this input uh, we pass and use it in styles and we describe it in the same way as we would do in this declarative uh, React-like JSX thing, right? So you can just read the code and you can say, okay, if it's primary, it will be this pinky color. And if it's not, it's not. And it's easy to read, it's easy to understand. So yeah, style component just removes this mapping uh, for us. And benefits are, yeah, um, because no, you don't have to mess with class names. So it, you kind of remove this, again, this hard, like hard manual work to get the class names, put the class name to DOM nodes. You like, we don't care about it. It's just implementation development, just styles. And the important thing, yeah, um, it, it has the same mental model of, of, of the whole application. So you start thinking about your application and style as, as one whole thing, which is, I think, really important. Uh, and because the model is the same and styles are just implementation detail, why not to reuse it in React Native? So it's kind of also as React did, it's, it's just a platform detail. It's just, you know, you can use same styles to style your React Native app native application on your phones. How amazing is this? Yeah, so um, it's kind of this no UI thing, which is defined by Alan Cooper. And no UI is about machines helping us instead of us adapting for computers. And the, like, you, if, you, like, if you're paying attention, it's like uh, the first thing, this uh, separation of concerns, it's us adapting to machines. It's like JavaScript, CSS, HTML. It's just, you know, I, I want to think about my UI, not about these details. Um, and now let's go to some myths and lies, <laughs> because there are lots of misconception and miscommunication uh, between communities. And first one, of course, is CSS and JavaScript is slow. Don't use it. Well. <laughs> First of all, it's not inline styles. So let's let's get straight to the point. So because uh, it's not inline styles, when you write code like this and you console log it, it produces some class name, which is unique. 
And that's exactly the point. You kind of, you, you, the library says you are safe to use it. There is no collisions between. Uh, so you can generate different styles for different blocks and there will be no collisions. No, no, zero. So it's, it's all good. And as you can see from this code, you can use it with any library, not just like React. Um, the second one, because we have now access to these low-level DOM APIs, we can actually make all these libraries fast. For example, this example for, uh, uh, again, by Alec, <coughs> shows us how by using CSS OM, he can exchange these class names at the 60 FPS speed, the same speed you would do by writing imperative um, code using uh, vanilla JavaScript and vanilla CSS. No difference at all. Um, but here you have all the benefits of this higher order abstraction, like describing things in, in a way everybody can understand. Uh, which brings me to the point that actually maintainability often is, should be more appreciated as speed. Um, and this is also a misconception, misconception with React I hear a lot. Um, so there are like articles comparing React to vanilla JavaScript code, proving that React is slower than vanilla code. Of course it is, it's an abstraction. But that's not the point of React. React's point is that it gives you a way of building huge applications without this, you know, getting like crazy and having all these bugs. So, um, Let's get to the right point. And similar there are articles comparing like CSS and JS uh, with like vanilla CSS. Uh, okay, again, um, it's not inline style, so you can't compare inline style performance to class names and say no, CSS and JS is slow because it's it's not. And the third point is that we often forget when we talk about this like implementation details, we forget that. Uh, performance issues are kind of fixable. We saw in a Houtini talk that we will get access to this low-level API nobody wants to use, nobody. But as a library author, you kind of want to use them because now you have the same code as a user, and now you upgrade to the next version and suddenly 60 FPS, 120 FPS. Why not? So this is possible, this is gonna be possible soon if it's not fast enough yet, but I think for most of us, all these libraries are fast enough. And that's the really important point. Don't optimize prematurely for performance. Um, and here's like a, a, a slide from one presentation showing how to do theming in CSS only. Theming in CSS. And this is how the code looks like. Uh, first of all, it's not CSS only, okay? It's, it kind of has pretty much a lot of JavaScript in it. But that's also not a point. Let's forget about it for a second. I don't know, like, do you really want to work with code written like that? Because to me, it's like, I don't even know what it is. I, I, one of the ideas was I, I will take this code and rewrite it in one of the CSS and JS libraries, but I didn't have enough time to prepare. So for, probably for next talk, just to compare, I really interested how much lines of code in JavaScript it will take me to do the same functionality. So how do you want to test this? How do you want to debug it? There are no tools for debugging CSS like this. So you can just go to breakpoint something and see what parameters there are in these variables. Uh, so we kind of, you know, we are powered by this, all these tools CSS gives us, but we kind of also stuck with all of this tooling, so it's not existing. Um, kind of can't remember what I wanted to say by this slide. Um, yeah, it's, um, I wanted to skip it actually, but it's about testing. So this is how easy it is to test your CSS and GS uh, solution. So you test it and you get some output and you just, this is a snapshot, this is a from chest uh, testing uh, library or framework. So you can compare this uh, presentation of your elements and compare them if next time there is different class name in it, you might say, oh, okay, something is broken. And there is also this belief that crafted CSS is much better for performance. So we are so good as humans to, as, at, at writing CSS. Well, just a couple of weeks ago, this research came out that says 70% of our 
like shared like this top 20, top 200 websites, uh, like Airbnb, Yahoo, whatever, 70% in median is repetitive. We don't need this. We don't need to ship this code over our network. So all this CSS code is just duplication. Well, OK, where is the solution? Let's just use this functional CSS yeah? or atomic CSS. And then atomic CSS, and this is how it looks like. Um, yeah, so this is the response by the community. Yeah, it's, a, it's the worst thing I ever saw. OK, there is a, this approach, like this is a functional CSS. It's called Tahyuns. I, I don't know how to pronounce it. It's a little bit different, but the idea is the same. You have this really, really tiny class names that each class name does one thing. But it's also it's kind of hard to, you know, how to, hard to say what it does if you don't know. And yeah, the response is again, is it the worst idea or just bad one? Luck, like, yeah. And the thing is, yeah, it, it's hard work to do these things again by manually, right? Because it's manual work. And as humans, we know how to automate things. And there is a library. It's called Styletron. And it's optimized for performance. So it's built for performance. And it enables this CSS optimizations out of the box. So this is really smart. So it, 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 it looks at, at your styles and sees if it's like the same declaration and just moves it to one class name. Um, and this is how it works. Because um, nobody cares how your HTML looks like when, when it's in browser, right? Um, nobody is seriously not but you or me. I also like <gasps> semantic CSS, non-existent. There's no such thing like semantic CSS. I wanted to make a couple of slides, but again, didn't have time. Um, yeah, but the API remains the same. That's the whole point that I'm trying to say here. You still have this nice API of describing what it should look like, and the library makes the optimization. And this is rmd.com CSS output file says, by using this library and comparing different CSS and JS solutions, and because of his optimizations, uh, uh, he could shave off 50% of a whole Airbnb CSS file. I just like, 50%, think about it, just like that. Um, so yeah, but the point is, let computers do their work. It's how it should look like in future. Um, yeah. The next one is also interesting. It's like uh, SAS has variables, mixins, uh, and it's, it's a powerful language. It's like Turing complete, right? We can, we can write programs in SAS. You know what? JavaScript is also, it's also W3C standard. And there is a nice article, and it's a good news for, for all of us. If you know SAS, you already know some JavaScript. In SAS, you have variables. In JavaScript, you also have some variables. You have some lists, and they actually look pretty much the same. So this seems like this is a meaningful difference in syntax, but the concept is the same. Mixins, yeah, it's functions. And there is even this polished project by Max Stoiber, uh, Reinhold and Nigraf, uh, two of them are also from Vienna, and my friends. Um, they made this project that is basically like Bourbon or this utility library for SAS, but for JavaScript. So now you have all these functions. And it's functional and it's immutable. It's all the nice properties in it. So you just write light and blah, 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 and pass your color. And, it, and it, you can, it can be used with any library, with any CSS and JavaScript library. Doesn't matter. Or in any JavaScript application, even. It's not just about CSS. It can be used everywhere. And there is this one. Uh, it's called, like, just use the platform. Platform is a power. We have to use a platform. Yeah, you know what? Um, I don't know, it's, it doesn't look like bright to me right now, just yet. Uh, this one dropped uh, from, so it's no, never gonna happen. But there is this experimental Glam library, and they just, what they try is they're experimenting, then try to polyfill these things. So when you use Glam and your browser supports it, you get like browser implementation. But if not, it still works because it's polyfilled. Uh, it will be slower, but it works. Style G6, same approach. Shadow DOM, non-existent. Re Shadow DOM rendered on server. Forget about it. No, just use the same basically syntax. It will compile it to some magic, and it will 
imitate your Shadow DOM renders on server. Okay, it's too complicated. It's always bubble, always. It's just too many tools. Okay. How many, like, I'm also not raising my hand. Raise your hand if you know how to extract critical CSS or are you doing so on your project? Okay, five hands. That's what I thought. I, I don't know either. I have no idea. Well, <laughs> it's five lines with style components now. So you, you add these five lines to your project to, and, on, on, on server rendering and you get it. And it's not just like, you know, something, some, it's, it's, it's really well taught. Um, and the thing is, if you build your app with progressive enhancement in mind, despite being written in JavaScript, it might not require JavaScript at all and, and the client. And that's a huge thing for me. And another huge thing is the future, because future is bright as I see it. And it's called universal rendering, because now you can have things like this written like this which is basically also the CSS, as you can see, or tools like React Sketch App by John Gold. Uh, does anybody know that tool? Okay, a couple of hands, good. Because this tool allows you to write React components and render them in Sketch App. Um, and there's all, even like yesterday, uh, Max tweeted that there's a support an in-styled component for sketch, for rendering in sketch, so you can reuse your styled components uh, code and render in sketch just like that. I'm running low on time. Uh, I think, you, uh, will you excuse me because I'm, I'm wrapping up. Um, um, so why would you, <laughs> yeah, it's, we don't need this. Like, yeah, take my, take my beer, bro. This is how you design this is your design system written in React so you can uh, compose your UI on production server, but at the same time, designers can go into Sketch, get full access to the whole library of your components and start dragging and dropping and direct manipulating them, this, these things in Sketch, which is much faster than designing this code. Because in code, you still, you know, you still, there is a mental overhead. It's not like direct manipulation. And this is what Brent Victor uh, speaking about. Of yeah, <clears throat> it's a good sign. I'm running out of time. Um, so imagine design system shared between designers and developers and production website and Sketch app and any other app. How cool is that? Like you just want internet, right? <laughs> yeah, this is how I felt when I saw it. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's cool. Um, yeah, why I'm here. Um, because I don't think we cry for help. I don't think as JavaScript community we need any help. I think that what we do is we experiment a lot. Uh, think of like Bubble. If Bubble wouldn't happen, we wouldn't uh, be where in JavaScript uh, world right now. And the other thing about CSS and JavaScript, it just enforces best practices through technology and shared knowledge because we, as a whole, we have so much knowledge. And that's why I am here. Because we need to talk to each other and we need to make this, like all this moment, we, we have to make it together. It's not about like, we not defeating CSS, we're not saying CSS is shit. Not, nobody, a couple of people say that probably. They feel kind of strong about it. I don't. I love CSS. CSS is amazing. But we have all this, you know, all this complexity going around. So to build the application, it's, it's hard work. So it's so much, so much to do, so much things going on. And styling is just one of his problems. So we don't have to focus on it 90% of time. And we kind of do when we start scaling this. And I think the approach we're taking right now with CSS and JavaScript is to help us, CSS developers, JavaScript developers, to make this work easier for us and ship more better features and make the world a better place. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have some time for questions, obviously. Let's shut it down. Dancing zero. <clears throat> So I have a number of questions uh, from Twitter and a few from myself. Uh, <clears throat> we used to have 
mm, plain CSS. Now it should be replaced with CSS and JS, you say. But evolution is all about coexistence and uh, competition. Do you think it's it's wiser to to let them live together and compete instead of just replacing everything with CSS and JS? Um, yeah, I probably wasn't quite clear about this, but CSS and JS uses CSS. So in style components, you even write CSS syntax inside this uh, template literal. So you use the same thing. You can basically copy paste your styles from your components and BAM components and paste it into JavaScript files. So it's basically where we write styles. It's not like how we write styles. There is another thing that you can write styles in JavaScript objects that might make sense if you want to check all of this. Uh, but again, you have a choice. So it's not kind of replacing anything. And again, you can convert vice versa. Yeah? So it's kind of it's deterministic how to convert this thing. So it's just where you write styles. So it's not a CSS file. It's a JavaScript file. Why do we even care about that thing where we write styles, right? OK, makes sense. Uh, uh, question from Daria uh, from Twitter. Can we use post-CSS plugins with CSS and JS? Is there any solution for that? Yeah, so there are um, projects that combine post-CSS with the whole pipeline, with CSS and JS solutions. I can't remember the name exactly, but if you, if you just Google for it or search for it, I use DuckDuckGo, uh, you will find it easily. And if not, just ping me on Twitter. I will help you to find this. Um, yeah? Okay, but you said like since we're this is a question from Gleb. Uh, since we're getting rid of separation of concerns, like ancient uh, idea, well, why don't we just render everything on GPU using WebGL? Like, why not get rid of JavaScript? I can go further. Like, where is developments in that direction? Where is reason them all? Uh, WebGL. Why WebGL not? is just a compile target. You can render React apps, which yeah, is yeah. written in JavaScript, into WebGL. If this is possible, you can you can render into terminal. You can render into like that's the thing. You have like basically your application is now a thing that is describing your UI, but how you render it, it's. Like, but it's, this is another question about why not getting rid of CSS as a technology as a language because it's maybe it's outdated too. I don't think so. I think CSS is just fine. CSS is, is an amazing thing to declaratively describe how your thing should look like. Yeah, it's a wise thing to say on a CSS conference. Yeah, I, I, like, I kind of expect more rotten tomatoes in my direction right now, but yeah, it seems yeah, to just be... Just wait for it, I have some okay. more questions. <laughs> uh, hmm. Is there a point in writing CSS and JS if you're not working on single page application or even if it's single page application but written in Ruby, or PHP or any, any, anything else in, where there's no JavaScript layer on a server or like no heavy JavaScript on a client? Like, does it make sense? Um, yeah, it's kind of a tricky one, I agree. But there are ways of like, um, cre like CSS modules, for example, they have some uh, solutions how to render CSS modules, generate class, class names like on, with Gulp. in Ruby. So yeah, basically, yeah. if it's if it's uh, a standard, if we can describe it, think GraphQL. It's just a like it's just an algorithm. So if we if we would have an algorithm, we could implement this algorithm in any language. So in future, I would imagine CSS in GS wouldn't be not CSS in GS, but CSS in some web, web workers with Houdini because it's much faster, right? So we could we could like implement algorithm algorithms in uh, any environment. Okay, we used to, we used to have this uh, problem. Uh, this is a question from Frontend Youth. Uh, it's a new podcast. <laughs> uh, this, we used to have uh, HTML in PHP, and it was it used to be like a bad thing to do, like mixing technologies, ifs and else, and like cycles uh, in in a code. Now we have the same mix of technologies, and it's really hard to say when CSS starts and JavaScript begins. Do you think it's a bad thing, or it's just a normal way of writing things? I think, again, it's um, the separation of concerns trend coming in and speaking with us and saying, like, no, this is a bad thing to do. I think the bad thing to do is not doing something that makes your work easier. This is a bad thing to do. If someone says you, you have to invert your keyboard and type backwards, will you do it because someone's, someone with like, I don't know, 50,000 followers sells told so? I don't think so, because you will say, no, you know, let's cut this bullshit. This is not what I will do. 
the same is here. Just stay open-minded, just try different approaches. Why not? I mean, if it's not working for you, it's OK. You, you, like, you still have this low-level technologies, but this is kind of an abstraction over it, and you can use this goodness right now. Why not try it out? OK, there's a question from someone, uh, from Alexei, who is already using CSS and JS, I guess heavily. Uh, <laughs> uh, I have one, only, only one problem with CSS and JS, project-wide themes or styles. Like, one or two are manageable, five to ten and more, like, it's just a mess. What would you recommend? Nothing. I have no idea how to solve this. My talk isn't about uh, technology in itself, it's about the way we think about technology, I but, guess. I mean, in CSS, it's easy. No, it's not. Well, it, it's, CSS is global by default. That's why project-wide styles are easy. In CSS and GS, everything is isolated. That's why it might be a problem, so. Well, you, you still can have, like, you, you still, first of all, you, like, most of these libraries still have escape hatches, so you can still have global styles, because nobody, like, this is not, thinkable to just like you know make all styles isolated because it's it's it, it's gonna break lots of things so yep. we have like all these escape hatches in these libraries and the second thing there's this like if you follow this approach you will probably just redesign the app and and the way how theme is passing down um so it's yeah um, I kind of have to look at the problem closely to say what I would do but there are solutions to this as, as well yeah so the thing is that in CSS, this is a cascade. It doesn't mean that in CSS and GS, it also should be cascade. That's yeah, my point. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Okay, uh, that's it. You're free to go. Thank you. Thank you again. <laughs>